Your Matt, please welcome the farmers. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to my friend and colleague Mark Ferguson uh, for his invitation to the university this morning. And uh, I know from having dealt with uh, Martin now for many, many, many years uh, that he is a passionate advocate for the industry. Uh, not just in what he says, but in what Martin does. And I'd like to acknowledge that here this morning. Uh, I could also acknowledge those who are here from Tourism Australia, also from the Department of uh, Resources and Energy and Tourism. Uh, also, I believe we have this morning here at Radio, former ambassador to China, so I'd like to acknowledge it as well given the work he has done in Australia's name in our largest growing market uh, in recent years, and also representatives from the industry and the government. Well, the industry has um, had a few challenges uh, since we last spoke. Um, you will talk about them in depth today, and uh, how we respond to those challenges will determine the future shape of the industry. But what's remarkable is uh, the industry's resilience despite these challenges. Uh, we've had to wrestle with uh, a dollar which has uh, reached the highest level since it's had since we floated the currency in 1983. We've had to wrestle with uh, ongoing global economic uncertainty uh, in North America and in Western Europe. And the impact of that in turn has had on consumer sentiment in those markets and preparedness to use discretionary income to travel. And of course, those challenges in Europe continue. Um, and if uh, that wasn't enough, uh, as we have uh, said here before, in Australia, uh, and particularly my home state of Queensland, we have a role in challenging natural disasters. I'm part of Queensland, but also in the last 12 months, southeast Queensland as well. And what's remarkable uh, is that despite all that, uh, we have still seen an increase in international visitor numbers to Australia. This is no small achievement. Um, and it demonstrates a resilience in the industry of which you, as its participants, should be collectively proud. If you look to the future, however, um, I would say a couple of things before addressing some specific remarks to China. Uh, the first is uh, to state again the fundamental reality that uh, your sector and its performance is critical to the future trajectory of the Australian economy. You represent some 5.5% of GDP, you employ just shy of a million people in this country, directly and directly. And therefore, as I've said before, and I'll say again, uh, as a matter of fundamental principle and reality, uh, the health of your sector is critical for the health of the Australian economy and the health of the Australian employment market. You simply need to know that we get that, we understand it, and particularly where I come from, in Queensland, it's a uh, part of uh, our DNA. And so what are the future? Let's think for a moment about um, the stats uh, on China itself. Um, in recent times, some of you may be inflicted with a presentation of mine called China 2.0. Uh, anyone uh, put their hand up who's heard this so far? Uh, okay, Mum has put me in times. You uh, wrote up the back there, and you can speak over that. It's a little long for the allocated time this morning. But China 2.0 is um, our way as an Australian government of trying to reframe the way in which the Australian business community conceives of the future of the China Australia economic relationship. <coughs> and that in turn, China 2.0 affects the change, changing structure of the Chinese economy itself. A few basic points. When the Chinese brought down their last um, five year plan, Twelve five year plan, it elaborates for the first time since 1978 uh, when they began their policy of opening up the outside world and new growth model, a new economic growth model for the future. And the essential characteristics of that model uh, is no longer a primary dependence on labour intensive manufacturing exports as the drivers of economic growth, but instead, secondly, and increasing orientation towards service-based industries based in China's emerging cities and resting in turn on emerging uh, 
consumer uh, effort within the economy, whereby domestic consumption becomes a much larger driver of growth over time than, in fact, it does of labour intensive uh, manufactured exports. This is a fundamental shift in the economic policy direction. And it's very important that the industry understands that this is not just happening accidentally around China, it has actually been proven from the center. So what does it mean in practice? The numbers I think you would probably be familiar with. Uh, but if we look, for example, at the emerging size of China's urbanization, I believe it was um, last year that for the first time in Chinese history, uh, which goes back a fair long time, the first time in 5,000 years that more people live in cities in China than live in the countryside, in urban concentrations rather than the countryside. This is a fundamental shift in China's demography, a fundamental shift, therefore, in the future income profile of Chinese consumers and therefore the sorts of services which they will wish to consume in the future. Uh, China's uh, urban population has increased by 446 million people over the, last 30, over the last 30 years. Its urban population now dwarfs that of both the United States and Europe combined. It's worth thinking about that. The gap will continue to grow. 30 years ago, China's per capita income was among the poorest in the world, at $280 per uh, annum. Now, in 2010, it is $4,382 per annum. And so what you are seeing is a new and historic shift from the countryside to the cities. You are seeing an historic increase in China's per capita income. And that average per capita income that I just referred to applies to the nation at large, of course it is much larger when you reach the larger cities. As China increasingly urbanized, the relative demand for the range of services grows and grows, creating unique opportunities for Australia. Related to this is a phenomenon which I believe our tourism industry and all Australian service industries need to grasp. And that is the rise of what I'm sure uh, former Ambassador Brady will speak to in a minute uh, when he addresses his conference. And that is the rise of what's called China's second tier cities. Often when we have looked abroad at the Chinese market, we think of Shanghai, we think of Beijing, and on a good day we think of Guangzhou. Uh, the truth is, uh, these are China's mega cities, but only a few. Right across China, we now have 93 Chinese cities with a population in excess of 5 million. 93 Chinese cities with a population in excess of 5 million. 8 Chinese cities with a population in excess of 10 million. So we have uh, something like 93, or for that matter, 101 cities in China, each of which is larger than our largest city, Sydney. It's worth reflecting on that. Because an historical model which has in any way seen whatever part of the Australian services industry you represent. China as some national homogeneous market, frankly, has long passed us by. Each of these are discrete regional and sub-regional markets. And what is pleasing to see in a presentation just made before was in fact the um, significant growth across China's principal airlines, China Easter, China Southern, the National Power and others. But therein lies the potential to grow the tourism market from China even further. My word of encouragement to this industry, this important industry for Australia, is to focus further and further on each of the markets which each of those principal cities represents. Many of which you will never have heard of, but each of which is larger than the city of Sydney. And it's critical that for the success of marketing the services industry from this country to that growing market, that we do so. Let's also put some other aggregate statistics in mind. The Chinese economy today, in terms of its gross size, is about the size of Europe. We need to begin to think of each of the provinces uh, in China as, in fact, equal to one of the countries of Europe. If you were to project out ahead for the next 10 years and look at China's 30-plus provinces, 
and actually merge that with a map of uh, each of the countries of Europe against their aggregate economic size it is a fascinating map to observe. Roll it out to 2050, it gets bigger and bigger again. So the regional economies, for example, that of uh, Zhejiang, immediately south of Shanghai, um, whose uh, provincial centre is Hangzhou. Uh, that regional economy uh, will be, within 10 years, the size of a middle-sized regional com uh, national economy in Europe. That's what's important. And as you travel across China's inland provinces, but increasingly the inland provinces, not to forget Sichuan and Chongqing in the West, it's important that we change the way in which we view the country and the markets contained within it, the subnational markets and the individual urban markets. Six of Chinese provinces currently have a GDP in excess of $1 trillion. We in Australia run a GDP of 1.3 trillion plus. Six of China's provinces have a larger, or have a comparable uh, economic footprint as does the national economy in Australia. So the reason I say these things is that we in Australia focus therefore on what I call China 2.0. This is a changing economic model with huge implications for the Australian citizens in Huge implications for the sale of engineering services, for education services, for health services, right across the spectrum as income levels rise in these 101 Chinese cities and the demands and expectations of local consumers commensurately rise. And within that, their aspiration and interest in tourism grows as well. But on an order of magnitude that we have not seen anywhere else in the world since of the base sum of the Chinese population. I would commend this gathering's attention, therefore, to what we in Australia have described as China 2.0. A couple of months ago, uh, we announced that we were taking a delegation to China, uh, the Trade Minister and myself, uh, on a China 2.0 mission. And we chose five cities, really easy by Australian government ministers or government-led trade delegations. We went to Chongqing in the west. Uh, we also went to uh, Changsha. Uh, we also uh, went to, uh, obviously, Guangzhou, because so often falls off the map, uh, and a couple of other centres as well. In the end, uh, I had an encounter with a cardiac system, so I didn't go. Uh, but I survived, that's why I'm still here. The, uh, <laughs> Uh, Trade Minister Anderson went, and uh, together with my Parliamentary Secretary Richard Miles. We took about 100 representatives of the Australian services industry, and the feedback from those who participated, I think, was generally uh, eye popping and mind boggling as they encountered the sheer size of just one of these emerging 101 Chinese cities and the fire that they deserve. Now, each of them is different, the markets are different, the income profiles will be higher or lower. But let me tell you, these are markets worth pursuing in their own right. If you sit back and apply a whole new conceptual framework to them, which has in your mind a template of European national markets or even the aggregate market of the United States, or even our principal source of international tourists, our friends across the Tasman. My final remark to the gathering this morning, of course, is that this cannot be to the exclusion of other emerging markets uh, across Asia. China is one part of the phenomenon, but this is the Asian Pacific century. You've heard it a thousand times, and it's true. That's why we talk about it. And China is very much uh, the engine room of regional growth right across the Asian Pacific. And therefore, as a consequence, we see positive income profiles, disposable income profiles for most of the economies of East Asia. That's why, for example, Australia welcomed visitors from other parts of Asia in higher volumes over the last year. Malaysia up by 14%, India by 11%, Hong Kong by 10%, Singapore by 9%, Korea up by 4 These are encouraging signs, and they are reflections of the reality that I've described earlier in terms of China itself. So, friends, colleagues, representatives of this important
support the industry for Australia. If I have one message for you today, it's let's open our thinking about China to an entirely new paradigm. That is, newly emerging urban China across 101 centres, each representing a dynamic market in itself. And that in turn fueling individual consumer demand for tourism services uh, across wider East Asia. Our Australian national branding in China and elsewhere in Asia remains good. Within China, it is very good, but much more still needs to be done. Don't assume that people sitting out in a city of five million people in the middle of uh, in the middle of Hunan province uh, know a whole lot about what this country has to offer. But the classical advantages which you referred to before, and we all know to be uh, true, time zones, the welcoming mat extended to visitors from China and the wider region, and the absolute imperative of quality services in this country dealing with the obvious linguistic divide and the need for Chinese language services across the tourism industry and wider Asian languages uh, and language capabilities across the tourism industry for themselves. So I'd encourage you to adopt and to engage in that new paradigm as the Australian government is doing. Secondly, together with Martin, Craig Emerson, the trade manager and myself, know that when it comes to selling the Australian services industry to each of these sub-markets within China, uh, we're up for the task, we're up for the challenge, and we'll work with you. Thank you for your time.